It's only in recent years that we've begun to find out how genes do their work. And as research and experiments go on, scientists are opening a new and fascinating chapter in the science of the genes, genetics. That next chapter of genetics is being written as multiple gene therapy treatments clear regulatory hurdles and come to market. And biotech stocks could be at a major turning point after FDA approval of the first gene editing drug using CRISPR technology. Government approval of these groundbreaking treatments could generate an unprecedented wave of medical innovation, ushering in what the New York Times is dubbed a golden age of modern medicine. But gene editing therapies aren't without risk, and questions remain about the safety and cost effectiveness of these experimental treatments. On this episode of Growth Stories, we dive into the science of gene editing treatments and how the boom in gene therapy drug approvals could transform the healthcare industry. Gene therapies that change how we treat and cure certain diseases are moving out of the laboratory and becoming a clinical reality. It could revolutionize healthcare and lift biotech stocks. We're talking about an entire paradigm shift in medicine, going from chronic treatments that you take every day, once a week, once a month, maybe twice a year, to theoretically a drug that you take once in your life or a drug that you take once and it's durable for five to eight to 10 years. That's reporter Allison Gatlin. She covers the biotech and medical sectors here at IBD and says we're at a major inflection point for the industry. Eight new gene therapy drugs have been approved in 2023 so far, and the windfall could be huge, with treatments going for as much as $3.5 million a pop. One research firm says the gene therapy market could be worth $82.2 billion by 2032. Now, you're probably wondering, what are gene therapies and what is CRISPR, and how do they work? To answer that, let's travel back in time a bit to 2003. That's when a team of international scientists finished work decoding some 20,000 genes that make up the structure of our DNA. The landmark Human Genome Project provided the world with its first map of the human genome. Those blueprints, coupled with Clinton-era investments in public health initiatives, accelerated a new wave of biomedical research. I want to emphasize that biotechnology companies are absolutely essential in this endeavor, for it is they who will bring to the market the life-enhancing applications of the information from the human genome. These gene therapies could theoretically cure devastating and debilitating genetic disorders like spinal muscular atrophy and rare blood diseases like hemophilia and beta thalassemia in one fell swoop by modifying the underlying code in our DNA. Gene editing takes things one step further by making targeted and deliberate changes to a specific region in the genome. CRISPR is one tool for changing the sequence of DNA to correct mutations that cause disease. CRISPR works like molecular scissors, meaning that the drug will find the intended area in the DNA. It will cut the two strands of the double helix and insert, edit, or remove the gene that's causing a problem in the body. From there, the double helix sews itself back up, and theoretically, the genetic edit is permanent to the human body. Those molecular scissors, known as the Cas9 protein, were discovered in 2011 by chemist Jennifer Doudna and Emmanuel Charpentier. Here's Doudna, who won the 2020 Nobel Prize in Chemistry and is credited with discovering CRISPR, speaking of the promise of gene editing before the Nobel Committee. I think this is a, a very exciting way to uh, imagine how this technology will impact human health. Advances in CRISPR technology have accelerated rapidly since Doudna's groundbreaking research, and the pipeline for potential treatments is expanding. There are currently more than a thousand cell and gene therapy treatments in clinical development, and 50 gene therapy drugs are slated to launch in the next few years. We're reimagining medicine where we go from a pill a day type of paradigm to molecular surgery, uh, that's a one-time procedure that's a cure for life. That's Dr. Sam Kolkarni, the CEO of CRISPR Therapeutics. In December 2023, the biotech firm, along with partner Vertex Pharmaceuticals, became the first to win FDA approval for its CRISPR gene editing drug that treats two rare blood diseases. It's gonna change how we think about the pharma market, how we think about medicine in general, and um, how we think about business models. Kolkarni says increases in pending FDA gene therapy approvals can be traced to the COVID crisis. 
The COVID response forced the FDA to become more flexible with fast-track drug approvals. The agency also diverted more resources to handle reviews for cell and gene therapy treatments. And what's happened is, as a result of that, there was tremendous investment in building up manufacturing capacity for some of these critical components uh, and an investment in technology development. What it also did is validate some of these vehicles for delivering these advanced drugs. You know, you've had more than a billion people take mRNA vaccines, and that gives the regulators more comfort about the safety of some of these medicines. And in December, the FDA approved the first CRISPR gene editing drug, which was developed by CRISPR Therapeutics and Vertex Pharmaceuticals to treat sickle cell disease and beta thalassemia blood disorders. Our lead program is called ExoCell, and it's a bone marrow transplant where we take cells out of the patient's bone marrow, engineer them in our manufacturing facility, put them back into the patient, and then they're cured, hopefully for life. Gene therapies like XSL must go through rigorous clinical research to prove that they're safe for patients and actually work as designed. The biggest concern over these gene editing drugs are unintended mutations caused by off-target edits. And while CRISPR treatments have shown great promise to treat a multitude of diseases, many researchers say more time is needed to study the potential consequences of these drugs. But time is not a luxury for people suffering from devastating genetic illnesses, who, because of their terminal diagnoses, are willing to put themselves through clinical trials for these potentially game-changing treatments, despite the risk. I wanted to speak to an actual patient about their experience with this treatment, so we hopped on Zoom with Atlanta-based entrepreneur Jimmy O'Lehair, who was one of the early participants in the CRISPR clinical trial. He says his quality of life was in the gutter because of sickle cell disease. It's a really, really confusing and painful disease. Sickle cell is a genetic defect that affects the way red blood cells deliver oxygen to the body. About 100,000 Americans suffer from the disease, which disproportionately affects people of African descent. All of my organs were in jeopardy. I, I, have, I had a heart attack because I wasn't getting good amount of red blood cells to my heart. My, my, my gallbladder has been taken out because of the same reason. And then also the hallmark of the disease is actually the amounts of pain you face on a daily basis. Sometimes they get extremely violent and those are known as crises. And to manage those crises, it's such a very painful disease that you can't take over the counter medication like the Tynerol or an Advil to alleviate the, those pains. You need narcotic pain medication. Ola Hare was hesitant to do a bone marrow transplant to deal with his disease. He learned of CRISPR gene editing through his research on treatment alternatives. He says he set up a Google alert on sickle cell and gene editing, but didn't expect any developments to happen for decades. Then two years later, in 2019, he got a news alert about the first patient in the U.S. to receive CRISPR gene therapy for sickle cell. He immediately contacted the team conducting the clinical trial. I had no concerns whatsoever. I was actually quite desperate, if I'm honest. My wife was eight months pregnant and I was terrified of passing that burden of, to my children. I had already passed it to my wife, my parents, of you know, being a caregiver. And one of the things I always wanted to be was become a parent, and I, I didn't want to be a parent and have sickle cell at the same time. I, I knew sickle cell was probably going to win that battle because it won every other battle in my life. So knowing that I was about to be a father, it was such an easy decision for me. Exocell is given to the patient in what's called the ex vivo method, meaning that the gene editing takes place outside the body. Doctors remove cells taken from a person's bone marrow, make the necessary edits, and then infuse billions of modified cells back into the patient. Olaher says the toughest part of the treatment was the intense rounds of chemotherapy to prepare his body for the infusion of edited cells. He describes his experience after the transplant. Uh, so I usually have this lingering pain all the time. It's this constant lingering pain. That's not a really a crisis, but just constant pain that's always there, no matter what's going on. Even if you're feeling good, for me, I always had this pain. And that was the first thing I noticed probably two or three weeks after the infusion that that lingering pain that just always niggles, you know, was no longer there. In an October 2023 FDA hearing, Vertex Pharmaceuticals reported that the treatment worked in 29 of 30 patients who were followed for at least 18 months without any serious short-term side effects. 
CRISPR therapeutics will follow patients like Ola Hare for 15 years following treatment to monitor for any side effects and off-target edits. And while Exocell doesn't cure sickle cell, the drug aims to provide patients with a lifetime of relief from its painful symptoms. My wife and I actually went and had children because I was like, I feel healthy enough to be able to handle this now. Life completely changed. I'm able to do things I'd always dreamed of wanting to do. It really boils down to is just having full control of my life. You know, before I did not have any control of my life, I woke up and sickle cell basically directed which way my life went. And today I wake up and I'm the one that's making the decision. And that's feels strange at, at the age of 38 to finally have control of your life. Ola Hare says that access and education will be crucial to getting gene editing treatments to sickle cell warriors, a population he says has been historically stigmatized and underserved by the medical community. And while gene editing treatments might not be for everyone, Ola Hare says he has no regrets participating in the clinical trials. For me, it's been life-changing. I, if I'm completely honest, I, I won't be where I'm at right now if I hadn't gone through this trial three years ago. It's completely changed my life. There's a lot of bullishness over how the potential approval of gene therapies could bring significant disruptions to the pharmaceutical industry. But biotech stocks still have work to do to fully tap the gene therapy market. While Vertex and CRISPR therapeutics have yet to disclose how much Exocel would cost, the price tag for these one-time gene therapy drugs is estimated to be in the millions. Will patients and insurers favor a potential cure at a massive cost over recurring, less expensive therapies? And how will biotechs overcome the possibility of sticker shock and manage manufacturing and reimbursement challenges? One of the biggest hurdles facing gene therapy and likely gene editing as well is the cost. That's IBD reporter Allison Gatlin again. She says drug companies will have to be strategic in how they price their drugs and work with insurance companies. In most cases, insurers will weigh the cost of chronic treatments against the cost of a one-time gene therapy. Gatlin says a recent study found the pre-Medicare cost of sickle cell disease treatment is around $1.6 million per patient. And that's for those under the age of 64 with insurance. Healthcare costs for patients with severe forms of the disease can be much higher. That's why biotech companies like CRISPR Therapeutics are starting with treatments for rare diseases. Most companies are focusing first on their small populations, trying to assure patients, regulators, and insurers that the technology works before trying it out in a broader population. And that tends to be the way medicine works. It's always an iterative process, starting with small patient populations and then moving into broader groups of people as the technology starts to prove itself. Some analysts, like those at venture capital firm Andreessen Horowitz, think the market will be willing to pay for high-cost gene therapies for the right patients. But despite the promise of these groundbreaking treatments, skepticism remains among investors. Biotech stocks are well off 2021 highs and remain volatile, and some companies producing gene therapy drugs are also struggling to gain commercial traction. But CRISPR Therapeutics and its partner Vertex Pharmaceuticals are looking to buck the market trend with CRISPR stock in particular attracting notable investor interest and price gains late into 2023. CRISPR Therapeutics CEO Dr. Sam Kulkarni says the secular shift towards cell and gene therapies will bring investors back to biotech stocks. From a fundamental standpoint, the pace of scientific advancement has never been faster. The business models are yet to catch up and it's taken us longer to figure out how do we create a business model that still is attractive uh, from a valuation standpoint and from a business standpoint that investors can get behind? But as we launch these medicines, as they gain traction, I think that skepticism is gonna go away. He says another big factor that will affect biotech stocks will be how big pharma embraces these new technologies. We've had one-off acquisitions here and there in the last three, four years but hasn't been a wholesale shift uh, from big pharma towards these new platforms, but it is gonna happen. And as soon as that happens, I think you're gonna have a huge rotation back, but once you have the first two or three get through, then there's gonna be a barrage of medicines that's, that's gonna come to the market. And my firm belief is in the next 10 to 12 years, nearly a third of the medicines that are commercialized 
uh, from a revenue standpoint, a third of the market will come from cell and gene therapies, which you know, will redefine how we think about the pharma industry, the pharma market caps and valuations. While headlines are currently focused on CRISPR therapeutics treatment for sickle cell, Kulkarni says the company is diligently working on gene editing drugs that will target more common maladies. We're going after three of the biggest killers out there, heart disease, diabetes, and cancers. And for all three, we have a solution that's very different from what you know, people think about as medicines, which are, you know, once daily pills or once a week injections. And all these, you know, are in the clinic now. So I think in the next 12 to 15 months, we're gonna have several readouts that tell us whether we're gonna be successful on the cardiovascular side, on the diabetes side, or on the oncology side. And that's gonna define the next phase of growth for the company. Kulkarni says there are countless potential applications of CRISPR tools that could open up a whole new world in healthcare. Only now are we seeing this powerful platform emerge where we're not just reading DNA, we're writing DNA. And that allows us to create, you know, new types of cells, new organs for replacement, and essentially treat multitude of diseases, uh, not just in the tens, but in the hundreds. Um, and the possibilities are endless. And we're just beginning that sort of secular growth in this market that's going to redefine medicine.